Hi, my name is Dan Sikulski. I'm a recovery support specialist with Chestnut Health Systems in Bloomington, Illinois, and also a member of the McLean County ROSC. And today I wanted to talk a little bit about the fourth and fifth steps. So um, you may have seen previous video where we covered steps one through three. We'll have a subsequent video or two to cover six through 12, but four and five deserve their, their own time. So. Um, a lot of people are intimidated by the fourth step because it's really the first time early on that we're asked to do some uh, looking inward at our past actions and wreckage that perhaps we've created and to do some writing, you know. So uh, first three steps were basically, you know, um, accepting and acknowledging the fact that we're powerless and, you know, just getting honest about that. Second step, we're basically uh, finding hope that there's something out there bigger than us, you know, kind of an internal resolve, a choice of resilience. And then the third step, we're basically demonstrating faith by continuing, making the decision to continue working the rest of our program, you know, with that faith that more will be revealed. And here we're looking at um, uh, inventory. The book talks about resentments, fears, fears, and sex conduct as the three main components that we want to look at in our fourth step. And the purpose of this video is just to kind of explain a little bit about why we do this or sort of what it is and kind of demystify and just walk through an example of what um, a resentment inventory might look like. Okay, uh, we're very clear in our literature or in you know AA literature, if that's your program of choice, it says on 64, page 64, Resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From it stem all forms of spiritual disease, for we have not only been mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. So, uh, important line there at the end, you know, basically saying that, uh, you know, a lot of the depression, the anxiety, the fear, sort of fear-based uh, symptoms that we show when we're actively drinking or using, you know, comes out like depression, it comes out like anxiety, it comes out in terms of, you know, looking like isolation. Our book is saying that when we take these steps, when we take the actions, we will have a spiritual awakening. And when the spiritual malady, the sickness that we have, that void, you know, inside, where, which causes us to turn to alcohol and drugs and gambling or sex, whatever it might be, to fill that sort of spiritual void, saying when we overcome that, then we straighten out mentally and physically. So for some people, um, you know, I count myself in this group, you know, I was seeing all sorts of psychiatrists, getting all sorts of medications for depression. Um, but really what I had was untreated alcoholism. And, you know, once I started getting into uh, my program, having a sponsor, working through these steps, feeling that new power flow in, the depression, the anxiety just kind of melted away. The fear was lifted. Now, I say that also recognizing that there are uh, many people that have clinical depression and um, you know, genuine anxiety disorders and other mental health challenges to deal with. And in those cases, you know, I'd say it's absolutely encourage you to see a doctor. It's between you and your prescriber, you know, how that's going to work out. Nobody in your program, your sponsor, people in your home group should be giving you advice on medications, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, so I'm not here to make any sort of statement on that. In fact, I just go by what the, the big book says on page 20, 133. There's a paragraph about two thirds of the way down that says we should seek, you know, uh, help from medical practitioners where, you know, where necessary. I'm um, just saying for some people, when we grow spiritually, we fill that, that spiritual malady that was sort of running our life and causing us to stay away from people, to not engage, to, you know, blocking us from you know, any sort of uh, sunlight, you know, of the spirit, some of those symptoms will, will dissipate. So that's a pretty cool promise. Um, it goes on, I'm 65, more about this resentment business. And if you're not sure, a resentment is basically just a grudge that you harbor against someone or something, you know, some sort of bitterness or jealousy or feeling that you've been wronged in the past and you carry that with you. People will say that resentment is like, you know, drinking poison and expecting the other person to get sick, right? We're the ones that are uh, sort of uh, bearing that cross and walking around with all that weight and that baggage and that anger over situations. And the other person is probably blissfully unaware, you know, not even really thinking about us, certainly not probably thinking about, you know, encounters in the past from years ago, or maybe they, they wronged us. 
So it's important we get, we get past this stuff. And that's really what the fourth and fifth step is designed to do. So if you go on to, on to 66, about a third of the way down, the first full paragraph, Bill Wilson, the, you know, basically the main author of the, the big book, goes on to threaten our lives about eight times when it comes to this business of resentments. All right, so uh, just real quickly, he says, it's plain that a life that which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. To the precise extent that we permit these resentments, do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile? But with the alcoholic, whose hope is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience, important line there, this business of resent, resentment is infinitely grave. There's one. We found that it's fatal. There's another one. For when harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit. The insanity of alcohol returns, and we drink again, and with us as alcoholics, to drink is to die. There's the fourth one. If we were to live, we had to be free of anger. The fifth mention. The grouch and the brainstorm were not for us. They may be the dubious luxury of normal men or women, but for alcoholics or addicts, these things are poison. There's another one. We turn back to the list, for it held the key to the future. We were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. We began to see that the world and its people really dominate us. In that state, the wrongdoing of others, fancy or real, had power to actually kill. How could we escape? We saw that these resentments must be mastered, but how? We could not wish them away any more than we could alcohol. All right, so they're making it clear, basically, we don't get this business of resentments taken care of. We don't free ourselves from, um, you know, the weight that, that the resentments carry. Uh, we're probably going to drink, and as alcoholics, addicts, to drink is the equivalent of to die. Because once we put that first drink or that drug back in our system after any period of abstinence, something happens in the brain, and we're off to the, the proverbial races. That phenomenon of craving sets in, the mental obsession. We'll do anything we can to get that next drink, that next fix. So hopefully that kind of frames, you know, uh, why resentments are important, why the force of it is important. Uh, we'll get to the fears and the sex comment, sex conduct in a moment. But what they do, and they give an example on, on 65, if you happen to have a book handy while you're watching this or something to look at in the future, I'm not sure how well it will show up on, on video, but they basically give an example of what a resentments inventory looks like. So the main uh, core of our force step, okay? And it says, uh, I'm resentful at, so that's the who or what, the cause, so why we have the resentment, affects my, and what it means by affects my is my basic human instincts, so things like relation, sexual relationships, personal relationships, our pocketbook, our ambitions, our pride, you know, our security, you know, our sense that we're just going to be okay, we're going to have, you know, lodging and food the next day. But it doesn't really talk about this fourth column. And what I'm presenting here is kind of a universally accepted format for writing out a four-step. You know, this is the way that I was taught by, you know, some old-timers. It's the way that I, I teach my sponsees. There's different formats, different worksheets. If you just Google four-step inventory, there will be more examples than you need. This is kind of one that works pretty easy. But really, the main key right here is the my role part. You know, we're, we're doing this stuff, we're talking about the resentments, how we've been harmed in the past, how it's affected us. But what, what we really want to get at is, what is my role? And it goes on a little bit later. It, um, it says, referring to our list again, putting out of our minds the wrongs that others had done, where had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? These four areas that our conduct was related to the resentment that we had. Because what we'll find in nearly every case that we played some role in this resentment, that we have some part to take. And it's difficult because it says we have to take the wrongdoings of others, you know, that, that have been done to us. We take out their part in it entirely. We just look at our role in that situation, our actions, our conduct, okay? Now, usually what a, what a sponsor will do, somebody um, who's doing a fourth step for the first time will be recommended they just do this first column first, okay? And what we're talking about is people, you know, of course, but also institutions when we say what. So like the institution of, uh, you know, your local police department or the institution of marriage or the institution of religion, you know, or um, some company that I used to work for that I felt did me dirty, you know, you could put that, that company name in there. 
So it's not just necessarily individuals. You know, a lot of people will have, of course, you know, a, a parent, a sibling, some sort of uh, ex-partner, you know. And we do name them by names when we do this list. Uh, we'll say, uh, just for the sake of argument, not to insult anybody, um, a resentment towards Catholicism. I had on mine, I had a resentment towards AA. You know, seven years in and out of the program, watching other people get sober, me con continuing to have, you know, setbacks. I started to be bitter towards people that were getting more sobriety than me or the program itself or, you know, started buying into, um, you know, some of the uh, thoughts that people have, you know, that it's uh, you know, not necessarily that it's cult, but that's something you might hear um, or that it's just not for me, you know, maybe that's okay for other people, but I'm going to try and do it my way. In my way it never worked, okay? So I finally had to surrender and uh, try it a different way, a way that's already been laid out, that millions of people have already recovered before me, right, or before you, and um, why not give it a shot? When I'm at my bottom, I'm gonna die from this disease, I've, you know, my marriage is about to be ruined, I've ruined my career already, I'm facing prison time, what do I have to lose by trying something? You know, just finally buying into it, saying I'm gonna give it a shot, you know, and I'm going to be open-minded and willing about it and just do the work that's suggested and stop trying to tinker things and, you know, modify it to be what's most comfortable or convenient for myself. Let's say we have uh, your, your who, your what. Uh, for the sake of argument, I'm going to put, say, my brother, okay? And this is a, a hypothetical situation. Was my brother on my four step? Yes, but uh, in case he watches this, you know, I'm just going to say this is completely unrelated, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so why? Some examples of, of why I might have a resentment against, uh, let's say, an older brother, okay? Uh, perhaps I felt that he was given more financial assistance in life with, you know, businesses or, uh, you know, get, helping get back on his feet, you know, from my parents. Whereas, you know, maybe I'm somebody who didn't have to necessarily go to my parents for financial help, you know, throughout my life. Another reason, uh, maybe he played a role or denied a role in my own alcoholism. You know, it could be a situation where uh, an older brother would, would buy a liquor for you when you were younger, kind of help enable you, and then when things sort of, you know, you're, you know, maybe this person was not an alcoholic, he could, could stop, you know, it, it's, he didn't have the disease. But, you know, you're the one who happened to catch the bullet as your disease progressed and you started going into, you know, treatment and um, struggling with relapse, you know, some, you know, you just kind of wash the hands of the situation and, you know, and family conversations with, with parents or family members, you know, sort of denied having any role. Um, it could be that just make up some, some wrong that they, he did to me when I was younger, uh, stole something from me. Now, I'm going to say my brother never stole anything from me, but uh, I'm just trying to, to give examples, okay? So this is kind of like what we're doing here. The point is we're not writing out our life story. We're not writing out every little thing that somebody's done to us. We're just hitting the high points, the bullet points, okay? Because when we do our fist up, we're going to share the stuff with our sponsor, whomever we choose. You know, it says, you know, that we, we do it with... Uh, God, ourselves, and another human being, you know, so we, up to us what human being we want to choose. More often than not, if we're working a 12-step program, we, we do it with our sponsor. But I know people have done it with minister, pastors, but it's really, you know, up to, up to you. Anyway, so you'll, you'll get into those details. Your sponsor will ask questions about situations. You'll, be, you'll have the opportunity to talk through this stuff more during your fifth step. For the fourth step, we're just trying to get through it. The point is we get through these steps quick, so the fourth step, we're not chronicling our entire life and every bad thing that's ever happened to us or that we've ever done. We're just chronicling the things that are blocking us, the things that are keeping us from progressing in our program, holding us back, the things we just find that we can't let go of. Okay. So then I look at my effects, effects mine in our, in our book. Um, in the six, page 65, 66, they give us the, the list. And I would say, you know, in a situation like this, if somebody stole from me or I felt was getting, um, you know, more monetary favor from family members, you know, it would affect my pocketbook. Let's say somebody who uh, told family members that you were out of control and kind of like set some ball in motion where, um, you know, you're set up to be like, look perceived as 
uh, not, you know, maybe a black sheep or just something that kind of was uh, slanderous, you know, to your character. You know, that would, of course, affect your pride. If it's a, a situation where uh, there's jealousy between siblings, I'm sure it would probably affect your self-esteem. If there is a resentment towards the person, it would affect your personal relationships. So you just list the ones that pertain to whichever resentment that you're working on, okay? And then so we get to that point, and now we have to look at what is my role? Where was I selfish, self-seeking, dishonest, or fearful? Fearful, that includes anger or rage, or if you've, you know, threatened people or, or you know, uh, been violent, that would fall under uh, either like self-seeking or, or fearful. So I look at this situation, well, actually, as it turns out, uh, you know, maybe I didn't turn to my parents much for financial help, you know, through a majority of my adulthood, but as I, you know, my addiction progressed and I was struggling with treatment centers and my insurance, you know, got to a point where they stopped you know, paying for, you know, paying for the treatment. I needed help from my parents as well. And guess what? They stepped up in a situation like that. Uh, again, we're keeping this hypothetical, but that would be an example of where, you know, uh, I'm being selfish and self-seeking by resenting somebody for getting the same favor that ultimately I ended up needing as well. Something else, saying that, you know, I'm out of control and I need help. Well, guess what? I was out of control and I did need help. And maybe, you know, somebody just doesn't, you know, not everybody is equipped and knows what to do or say around, you know, a family member in particular, you know, a sibling who's struggling with, with an addiction. And maybe the only way they know to deal with it is to confide in family members. You know, maybe they feel that they're not going to, you know, if they talk to you directly, they're going to get denial, or they just don't know what to do. And that's really the only thing they can think of, you know, and that's okay. Other situations, you know, well, I stole too, you know. Wine bottles, you know, from family members, pills, whatever it might be. So that's kind of, you know, sort of, sort of the way it is. Or if it's a situation where I'm resentful, resentful because we got into this big fight ten years ago and I've never gotten out of it. Well, what's my role in that? You know, say it was over, who knows what, but say it was over, just over like an insult or something. You know, well, guess what? I also insulted the person. You know, or maybe I'm the one who even started it and it just got out of control. You know, so I'm looking at those, those areas where I'd play a role in it, okay? And the reason we do this, one of the big reasons, and what my sponsor would do when I got to this point, is he'd say, think of your character defect that most describes your actions in relation to this particular resentment. And it would be things like jealous. You know, another part of my role is I secretly got enjoyment when, when my brother had setbacks or failures in his life. You know, when he had a business that that didn't work out or he lost a job or something. Some part of me took uh, enjoyment out of that. So that would be like callousness, right? It's not showing up so well in here. Another thing I had some where I was a thief. I was a liar. Um, I was judgmental. So the point of that is when we get to our six and seven steps, which are about turning over our character defects, we have a pretty good idea of what they are. And you know, in the back of our head as we go through life and we think about the things we've done, you know, it's people or in certain situations that we're not proud of. We probably already know these things, but there's something about writing it on paper, getting it down, telling somebody, you know, openly about it, you know, that has, uh, that, that helps us, you know, it has sort of a cathartic effect. So when we get to our sixth step, we know what our character defects are. You know, six, we're basically entirely ready to have God remove these defects of character, and we'll get to these steps. Uh, so we're just saying we're ready to let them go, and then step seven, we, you know, we ask, humbly ask God to remove our, our shortcomings. And there we're just day to day, we're asking our higher power to take these things from us. So that's basically the resentments inventory. All right, we do that for each thing we can think of. A lot of times we'll go into it and say, I'm a pretty chill dude. I don't really have resentments. You know, I don't uh, worry about people like that. You know, I'm laid back. That was some of the things that, you know, I kind of thought to myself. But when we're really honest and open and we look at it, you know, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot more than we think initially, okay? I think I ended up, you know, after saying, oh, I don't really have that many, I ended up with almost 40. So next we have to look at our fears. And in the book, it gives us some guidance on this. That's the, the second main part of our four step, our fears inventory. And it says at the bottom of 67, notice the word fear is bracketed alongside the difficulties with Mr. Brown, Mrs. Jones, the employer, and the wife. He's referring back to page 65 where they give an example of the resentments inventory there. 
This short word, talking about fear, somehow touches about every aspect of our lives. It was an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. It set in motion trains of circumstances which brought us misfortune we felt we didn't deserve. But did not we ourselves set the ball rolling? Sometimes we think fear ought to be classed with stealing. It seems to cause more trouble. And here's where it talks about the actions we take. We reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, even though we had no resentment in connection with them. We asked ourselves why we had them. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Self-reliance was good as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough. Some of us had great self-confidence, but it didn't fully solve the fear problem or any other. When it made us cocky, it was worse. So basically what we're saying is, what's the fear and why do I have it? So uh, a little bit more straightforward in here. So uh, fear, you know, it could be all sorts of things. I, I think I ran out of paper and ink when I did my fears inventory. You know, I was so run by fear um, at the, you know, once I reached my bottom and, and was, um, you know, early in the process of, of healing and recovery. Fear is loss of freedom. Why do I have it? Well, because actually, then at that point, as I was writing out my first four step, I was facing four to seven years in prison. And I have that freedom because I have family, wife, daughter. You know, I have these visions, you know, this vivid sort of night, night daydream, nightmare daydream, whatever, of my daughter, you know, it was in grade school at the time, and they're going around class saying, you know, my dad works for this company, my dad's a fireman, my dad's a policeman. And, you know, my daughter said, well, my dad's in prison. That was just like something that I carried with me. So a uh, legitimate fear. Another one might be uh, fear of divorce. You know, like college sweetheart since 1994. You know, at this point in uh, 20 years later, uh, she, you know, based on everything I had done in our marriage and, you know, through my addiction and the, the lying and the stealing and uh, the betrayals, you know, she had seen a divorce attorney. And uh, why I have it? Because I love her. I don't want to lose her and ultimately, you know, feel like a failure. Uh, just some of the reasons, there are more. Another one, fear that I had, fear of recovery, of relapse, right? Gosh, I've gone on and on, different treatment centers, 28 days here, 20 days there, 17 there, detox in between, you know, just depending on how much insurance would pay for. And um, I'd had enough uh, history of basically chronic relapse so of course I have a fear of recovery. You know, this is my last shot. I'm at a long-term facility, one of the best places in the, in the country, in my opinion, and from what I'd read and heard. What if it doesn't work out this time? You know, I put everything I have into this and you know, sold all sorts of things off to help pay for it. Gone to my, my family, my parents for help to you know, continue to pay for it as I was extended with the treatment. You know, why do I have it? Because I don't want to die. I don't want to put my family through that. I've already lost a sister related to, you know, addictions and, and eating disorders. And, I, you know, to do that to my parents again, you know, imagine seeing how hard that was on them the first time, you know, and then to lose another child. Uh, all sorts of reasons why I had a fear of recovery or relapse. I should say relapse. Next one would be recovery. Why? Because it's not going to be comfortable. I don't know really what to expect. I don't know if I can do it. Up to that point, you know, I had some periods of sobriety, but for the most part, they've been a consistent failure. So I fear recovery. So you get the idea. It could be fear of the uh, local police department. You know, it could be fear of terrorists, you know, fear of family members, whatever it is. You know, it's just writing down why we have them, and then we talk to our sponsor, talk that stuff through. And most of the time, what I ended up finding out for the 50 whatever amount of fears that I had, it came down to two things. What I really had was a fear of failure and a fear of inadequacy or not living up to potential. Everything I had, lost the going to jail, being divorced, relapse, you know, not being able to attain recovery, um, all that stuff, it came down to fear of failure, fear of being inadequate. So that gave me some insights into I talk over and over how fear is running my life, you know, as I was at my bottom. And everything I did, every decision I made, every action I took was fear-based. And it was really all about, I just didn't want to perceive myself or be perceived as a failure or not good enough. Last one, sex conduct. And we also get some guidance in here, uh, starting at the bottom of 68. It says, now about sex. 
many of us needed an overhaul, overhauling there. But above all, we tried to be sensible on this question. It's so easy to get way off track. Here we find human opinions running to extremes, absurd perhaps. One set of voices cry that sex is a lust of the lower nature, a base necessity of procreation. Then we have the voices who cry for sex and more sex, who bewail the institution of marriage, who think that most of the troubles of the race are traceable to sex causes. They think we don't have enough of it or there isn't the right kind. They see its significance everywhere. One school would allow man no flavor for his fare, and the other would have us all on a straight pepper diet. That's a great line. We want to stay out of this controversy. We don't want to be the arbiter of anyone's sex conduct. We all have sex problems. We'd hardly be human if we didn't. What can we do about them? So here's the actions it suggests, the middle of page 69. We reviewed our conduct over the years past. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate? So there we go again, similar to that my role in the resentments inventory. Whom had we hurt? Did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? Where were we at fault? What should we done instead? We got this all down on paper and looked at it. In this way, we tried to shape a sane and sound ideal of our future sex life. We suggest, subjected each relation to this test. Was it selfish or not? We asked God to mold our ideals and help us live up to them. We remembered always that our sex powers were God-given and therefore neither to be used lightly or selfishly, nor to be despised or loathed. So with our, our sex conduct, the third part of the, of the uh, four-step inventory, we're basically looking at sim similar format, who have we harmed, and then uh, what have we done. We won't write it all out for the sake of time here. And then uh, where had we aroused jealousy, suspicion, bitterness, and then lastly, what was our role in that again? Where, where were we selfish, dishonest, self-seeking? And we write this stuff out. Again, we're just doing bullet points. We're not chronicling everything we've ever done. Again, this isn't about every one-night stand that somebody's ever had or any time you know, uh, somebody didn't call us back or vice versa. We're looking at what is the stuff that's still holding us back. You know, what, when we try to move forward with our recovery or with our life, you know, what, what is that anchor that's pulling us down? And those are the things that we want to get out. And what it says later in the book is, you know, as we get the stuff out, we talk through it with our sponsor, our recovery mentor, you know, we want to achieve this sane ideal for our future sex life, okay? So uh, some of that gets into, you know, not seeking out relationships early in recovery, but it basically goes on to say, if we continue to take actions that harm people, you know, in recovery, you know, that goes directly against being spiritually fit. So we can't claim to have uh, spiritual growth, and yet we're still harming people with our sexual relations. And it says, if we continue, you know, if we, if we have a setback or we do that and we're sorry about it and we make it right, we make amends, then it's okay. But if we continue to do it, then we're going to drink again. And again, with us, to drink is to die, or to use is to die. So it's stressing the importance of... Um, not continuing those past behaviors. And another thing about, last thing I mentioned about the, the sex inventory, when this book was written and published in 1939, they used the word sex interchangeably with gender, okay? So it is actually acceptable to have like family members in your sex inventory. And what I mean by that is uh, some sort of resentment that you have, um, some sort of uh, you know, resentment you may have caused to somebody in your family. So an example might be, uh, say you are the only boy and you have three sisters. And you use that as an advantage growing up and you use the fact that you were the only boy to gain favor with your family or to ma manipulate situations. And you did cause jealousy, suspicion, and bitterness. And that's an example of what you would want to get down, okay? So it's gender and it's also you know, traditional sex behaviors that we think of. Um, another thing, with this particular inventory, there's also a lot of examples online. There's all sorts of worksheets where you don't have to, um, you know, write out everything that's ever happened. It just kind of gives you simple checklists like, check, yes, I caused jealousy. Yes, I caused bitterness. Yes, I was selfish. And then when you go through that with your uh, sponsor, your um, you know, peer specialist, whoever you end up doing your fist step with, you can talk that stuff through a little bit more, but just for the sake of getting it down on paper, there's a lot of simple uh, checklists. You just put four-step sex conduct inventory, something like that, and you'll have all sorts of examples. 
And of course, you want to, when you get to this point, you want to talk with your sponsor about you know, the sort of format that, that they want you to use. Some may already have something prepared. And so when we get all this stuff down, we write, we want to do this quick. There's no reason to wait nine months to do a four-step. If you're in a situation where you're working with somebody and they're letting you get to you know, six, nine months in, you haven't done your four-step, you may want to look at that. Because again, the key to finding that spiritual experience through a 12-step program is doing the work quickly. All right? You always can go back to it and do it more thoroughly, but you want to get through it as um, quickly and you know, complete as you can, knowing that you, know, you continue to work these steps throughout your life, and you'll have a chance to get stuff that you miss the next time through. Um, so that is it for four step. We will have more videos on 6, 7, 9 through 12. Thank you for your time. And uh, if you like this video, please click like, share it with somebody. Appreciate your time. Thank you.